everyone. Welcome to another episode of Crypto Current. Your host here, Richard Carthon. And today I have a special guest all the way out in North London working on a project that I know that I'm excited to learn more about. We have Dave with Pluto Digital. How are you doing today? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Man, I'm amazing. Uh, you know, as we get closer to the end of the year, I'm, I'm pretty hyped about what's to come in the future of crypto. You know, I think there might be a little bit of a cool off, but you know, Bear, bear times aren't bad. It's a good time to build. And it's also a great time for DeFi, which I believe Pluto is a DeFi play. So I'm excited to learn more about that. Before I do, though, I want to learn more about you. Can you give us some background on yourself? Sure. So I started very boringly doing accounts, uh, but then quickly transitioned from that, uh, having to come in at five in the morning and uh, process these trades. I didn't want to do that forever. So I learned how to automate the process, learned how to code, just built that, automated that system. It went crazy from there. After coding for a load of years, I got into product and eventually left uh, the big companies like JP Morgan, got into the SaaS world, into the startup world, went through AI and uh, eventually started getting into crypto. Nice. I mean, to automate your trades, uh, that was a big undertaking. To, to take that step and say, like, I'm going to figure this out and see how I can make my life easier. Um, and then even to do that from the traditional world into now the world of crypto, that is 24 hours. I mean, I'm sure that even that was even bigger jump, right? It was, yeah. I was driven by being lazy, <laughs> I think. <laughs> I wanted to get out. I didn't want to get out of bed so early. Uh, and I didn't like being told that it couldn't be done. So I was determined to uh, try and find a way of improving that. And... I think that's driven me ever since um, just trying to find better and more efficient ways of doing things. And yeah, and I think that's probably what a lot of the philosophies are around crypto and a lot around DeFi. Right. I mean, a lot of innovation happens around how do I simplify things and have to do um, less work to get maximum efficiency, right? But even talking about that, right, you... you learn how to start doing some automated trading, but when you leave the traditional world, you know, JP Morgan, and start looking more to the world of crypto. So like, what was that first introduction to the crypto space? So I vaguely remember reading about, or maybe it was either reading or listening to something about Bitcoin in, I'm sure it was 2011, 2010. And it sounded interesting and you could invest in it, but there was no really easy way of getting your money in and out. And, uh, I didn't have any money, so I wasn't going to start risking it on something like Bitcoin because it sounded like a crazy idea. Um, what a fool I was. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the way I try to pitch it to people and why I always try to bring that up is you don't have to put in everything. You don't have to put in an extravagant amount of money to get started and then see, have that be the fuel that gives you some of the initial capital to then start investing even more so once you learn more. Yeah, I didn't think I had any, anything to take a risk with then. Um, so, th yeah, looking back on it now, I think I should have bought well, everyone. Hindsight, yeah, should have put everything <laughs> in. Right. No, but all good. But I mean, again, so you, you learn about it early and then now you start to transition into, you know, what has now become Pluto Digital. So, can you tell us about that story of what was the vision behind it and what are you ultimately trying to build? So, Pluto Digital is a technology, crypto technology and operations company. Um, we've got a few different divisions. We've got uh, our Pluto Ventures, which looks at uh, getting involved in blockchain technology companies. Uh, we've got the Metaverse company, which is uh, on fire right now, getting involved in so many different things. Um, but then there's the, the area I'm heavily involved in, which is our DeFi division, which is about to launch a new app, web app called Yop. All right, let's learn more about that. So what is Yop? So Yop is a yield optimization platform. And what it's going to do is it's going to take your cryptocurrency and put it through different protocols so you can earn yield on it. Um, so yeah, it's for uh, native DeFi users. And um, yeah, I think it's, it's something that sits in a space that we see a gap in. Um, I think there's a lot of yield platforms out there that probably look like 1980s video games. They're probably not the sexiest user interface, um, but you know they, they, people are drawn to them because they give you good returns. That there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of money that can be made. I think you've got the other end of the scale where you might get a bit more of a sexy UI. Everything feels a lot cleaner, but they kind of obfuscate where the yield might be coming from, what they're doing with the different protocols. 
Um, and I think that might put off some of the people that just want to know what's going on behind the scenes. And uh, we, we sit slap bang in the middle of that, where we are trying to be as transparent as possible, but give you that, that comfortable user experience as well. Excellent. So your the goal is to have easy user onboarding and obviously uh, easy user offboarding. Um, how do you, usually a, a big challenge within the world of DeFi is one, being able to have a bunch of different protocols you can get into and to get the maximum yield, right? To, so if you're aggregating a lot of that together, um, you know, is there like a projection of how many different types of uh, cryptos people would be able to get into? So I can't get into too much detail. It's all going to be coming out in the white paper in January. But what I can say is we'll have our vaults, our, our smart contracts, which will contain multiple strategies. And the users can come in, see what uh, the projected yields are on these different strategies, and then can allocate their crypto into the different vaults. Nice. Okay. So, so basically there's going to be different kind of, I don't want to say tiers, but different types of ways that they could get in and then get different types of rewards based on either risk tolerance or what type of cryptos they would want to be rewarded in. Exactly. And we'll use auto rebalancing to ensure they're getting the maximized yield. Excellent. So with that, you know, a, a big challenge in the DeFi world, of course, is security and making sure that if I'm going to be... Um, taking my asset and giving it to another protocol or et cetera, that um, I will have the ability to get it back. Um, what are some of the things around security that y'all are putting in place? So we've got, I mean, we take security very seriously. We've got um, a risk score that is a, a Pluto uh, proprietary piece of uh, tech that we're building out. And that will be used to calculate uh, risk, ensure that we, and taking variables to ensure that we've got a, a proper risk calculation done on the uh, the strategies that we're putting in place. Um, so we're making sure that we're not just going to throw it in the latest thing that someone's been sent on Twitter or you know, Discord and go and and go after that. We want to we want stability. We we think uh, Yop's going to be around for a long time. So uh, we need to look after our reputation and and not make uh, stupid bets. Um, but on the other side of that, we've uh, again we've. The smart contracts we're putting together, they're all getting audited by reputable external companies. Um, we, don't, we don't want to just uh, fire and forget. We, we, again, we take, take it seriously. We want to make sure that everything is, uh, is QA'd properly, that people that have been around the block have seen lots of smart contracts, they're, they're getting it all checked out. Uh, and then we want to make sure that we're taking all the, the necessary steps with um, you know, any coming uh, in a legal uh, thing that's coming around the corner for DeFi. So, you know, we're being very careful with, um, you know, what we're setting up, making sure that, you know, we're, we're looking at what we're doing and, and making sure they're sensible anyway, but then we're getting these things double check, triple check to make sure that we've not missed anything. There's no red flags, nothing we're going to be caught out on. So, yeah, we want to make sure that every single part of our operation is is bulletproof. Right. And that's very crucial, um, especially as um, unfortunately a lot of hacks that have happened this year have been in the DeFi space. And so security has always got to be of the utmost importance. And, you know, another thing that I, I want to just unpack here is the importance of DeFi and potential bearish time. So we've seen a tremendous year in the world of crypto this year. And it appears as we kind of wind down uh, 2021 that uh, we're starting to see some people take some profits. And there's a chance that we still might see a final run up to end the year slash go into the next quarter, but we also could just see it cool off. Um, why do you, do you believe or do you think that DeFi is a good way to hedge against when these moments happen in the space? Yeah, I mean, we used to see that when the markets crashed, everything would jump into gold or something like that. The dollar would get strong if the markets crashed. Bitcoin is seeing that sort of that sort of uh, safe haven. Every time there's a bear market, it's not as weak as the previous one. Um, you know, we start panicking. I think a year ago was it less than twenty thousand dollars for uh, you know, and everyone's panicking now because it's at forty odd and you know, before that, we were just saying, oh, if we can get through 50, and now because it's not at 50, everyone's panicking. Um, but you see the noise in social media. Everyone seems to have a crystal ball. 
and says, oh, you know, the market's you know about to end or it's going to do this, it's going to do that. Um, so the predictions out there are on it are crazy. I think what we can see is there is a trend and it's going up, up and to the right. And um, that that's the only positive. I think you're seeing a lot of different uses for crypto that are coming to the market. It's getting taken more seriously. A lot of big players, big companies are getting involved. It's it's, it's getting on more people's radars. Um, it's just it's just it's just starting to make sense for a lot more people. It's no longer that crazy idea that seemed like something that could be uh, this rebellious anti-establishment thing. It's now becoming the establishment. You know, you talk to banks, they're getting involved. Jamie Dimon's not a big fan of Bitcoin, but he says that JP Morgan will get involved in it because their clients want it. So they've got right. attention. Right. And, and to that point, I think part of the hesitation for a lot of these larger institutions has been around regulation and not having clear guidelines and understanding what that looks like. But I think once we turn that corner, <laughs> we see the floodgates open. Uh, personally, that's that's what I think. But you know, what what do you think is going to be crucial for regulation as we go into the future of crypto? I think the, the way I see regulation, this is why Pluto and Yop take it seriously. Is it's coming. Um, I think a lot of early stage startups, DeFi, crypto, are probably not focused on it as much as they should be because I think when it comes, I think a lot of these players are not going to have the time, the resource, the knowledge, the finances to back up what the SEC or the FCA can throw at them. Um, it will come like a freight train and it's going to be, it's going to, it's going to put so many people on their ass and it's going to leave, you know, very few out there. Um, not only that, on the flip side of that, if you look at you know, how Pluto and Yopa are established and we need to make sure we're, we're rock solid. That's why we take security and everything so seriously. When the SEC regulates the uh, you know the market, all of a sudden there are going to be so many new players coming in, in in the US, for example, because they'll suddenly know that these are the goalposts we can operate in. The SEC is not going to stop me. I can now get on with it. Exactly. And I believe... All there's a tremendous amount of money sitting waiting for that moment because as soon as they can de-risk um, a lot of the high profile, unfortunately, the traditional world does not like to uh, delve into the unknown because they don't have to. Um, luckily, they're in a market where uh, they know the rules and they can stay in those rules and do very well and not have to uh, rock the market. But for a lot of these people, even if you were to take 1% of their allocation and then have to explain how half of that 1% went down 60% because crypto dipped that day, they don't even want to deal with that kind of headache. But as soon as they can understand the rules of engagement within how this is going to operate from a regulatory standpoint, they're going to jump all over this. Right, they're just they're waiting for the moment. And I think that's that's the challenge we've had as well. You know, the problem, uh, I think, anyone's uh, greatest strength is usually their greatest weakness. I think one of our our greatest strengths is how seriously we take security. It turns it into a weakness for us because it slows us down because we don't know what the goalposts are. So we're covering all the bases for security. It would be nice to be told they're over there and this is what it looks like. Deal with it rather than just guessing to make sure that we've got everything covered. It makes it a lot harder to operate. It slows us down and you just don't want to, you don't want to be slow in, in the crypto world. It, it, everything happens so fast. You, you need to be cool. And um, we, need, we, need, uh, we, need, we need security. We need, we need uh, the regulations to come in as well because to attract the, um, some of the major, the major money, people need to be able to know they can trust it. People are still scared of rug pulls, or is this legit? You know, are you, you know, are you a, a company that's just going to take my money and vanish? If there was more regulation around it, then it's people are going to feel more secure putting their money into it. So you see, regulation will come. It was, you know, the markets will dip because everyone will panic, and then they'll come back even stronger, and they'll stay there. 
Right. Yeah, man. It's, it's, it's only a matter of time. It's not if, it's when. And I feel like we're getting closer to the win, um, which is which is nice. And, you know, on that, uh, when is uh, the app, app coming out? Because I know a lot of people are probably excited to, to check that out. So, yeah. So the white paper will be out in, um, hopefully, should be January. I'm going to get shot by saying that um, because uh, I'm sure it should be, definitely. 100%. Um, private, the private launch. So we have a private launch for the for, for YOP coming out following the white paper. It should be, uh, you know, weeks, a matter of weeks after the, the white paper. Uh, and that'll be accessible if you have a, a YOP NFT, which you can get on the secondary market through OpenSea. And then following that, we'll have the public launch, which again should be a matter of weeks following the private launch. And then, um, yeah, then it's open to the public. And then it's then it's just iterate, iterate, iterate. We're going to be constantly adding new strategies, adding new exchanges, getting onto new blockchains. We, yeah, we don't see this as a fire and forget at all. Um, no, we have a list of new features that we're constantly looking to add to this. We've had uh, had a workshop last week in, in London with guys, our developers, all over in Ireland. They all came over to London. We had a two day workshop. We've got a list of things now that are probably going to keep us busy for the next five years. So we are we are not going to run out of things to do. And you, know, you, you get involved in in YOP, then uh, you're just going to constantly see new things coming out that are just going to boost that token because it's the more features, the more incentives, you know, the more partnerships. Um, that we get involved with, the more utility that token has and the more reason that you have for holding it. Yeah, for sure. And like you said, the more utility, the better, right? And on that, you, you brought up the fact that if you owned a, a Yop NFT, yet you could be one of the early users. So I've seen that that's been a strategy for a couple of different people. It incentivizes early adopters and also lets them kind of test things out. So like you said, if if someone's listening to this right now, they can go to OpenSea, find that NFT, and then they will be able to have early access to this. And even if you think you've missed a boat, there's no cutoff for that. Um, so even during the private launch, we will, you know, if you get an NFT after the launch date, you can get access to that. These NFTs, we we realize that we want to continue driving the value for them. So after the public launch, they're still going to have value. They'll get you know access to dedicated vaults or early access to vaults. So you can benefit from the, the lower users and then the higher increase in yield. Um, so we are, we're really looking. We believe in utility. And I think that's the thing to a point I made earlier. There's a lot of projects out there that just want to mint coins and make money. Um, we're planning on being around for a long time, many, many years. And that's not going to happen by just making a load of coins and throwing them out there. We need to make sure they have a use, they have utility, you know, that people really see the value in holding these um, and how we can you know, work with other partners to really drive value for this. Definitely. And one more question just on on the subject of of you brought up all of the different types of uh, protocols that you're going to be built on. What is, is what is the base level protocol that y'all are built on? Um, and then what kind of other chains do you see uh, Yacht being able to interoperate with? So we've done a lot of work with uh, Yearn and Curve. So they're, they're some of the main things, main protocols we've been looking at. As far as other chains, I, <laughs> Binance is always one that keeps getting banded around. Um, I think it's going to depend on ETH 2.0. Um, you know, DeFi is very different to a lot of a lot of the metaverse in that in that respect because Ethereum is where the liquidity is. So it's very difficult to go and build a DeFi project on another chain and, and you know, be a hit out of the blocks without that without that liquidity. Um, but once that gas fee assuming that gas fee comes down with the, assuming uh, hopefully, assuming, yes. hopefully touch with it. um it's going to be interesting to see how the other chains react because you know they're getting they're getting the the publicity at the moment because of the the cheap prices and the speed and that sort of thing but are they fast because of their design or are they fast because of the the lack of uh, users on them um 
you know, so it, it's hard to tell without, you can't do the load testing, pro, you can't do a proper load test without the load. You can, you, you can simulate it, but it's not going to give you the, a proper test. So I'm really curious to see where ETH 2.0 takes us. And um, if that is, if that has the desired effect and it reduces the gas fees, then uh, it'd be interesting to see how much, uh, how much people are shouting for all these other chains. Because the liquidity is in Ethereum, but we realize at the moment that the gas fees are a real turnoff. Huge turnoff. Um, again, where, where in the world would you go if you went to the bank and said, hey, I want to take off 50 bucks and they say, yeah, that'll be 150. And you're like, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> it's absurd, man. <laughs> and they, they've got to fix it. Uh, I, I'm, I, I'm hopeful because I, I really think Ethereum is an amazing chain. But like you said, like it's been stress test. But the problem with the stress test is that it's failing because it's making it exclusive to people who have a ton of money. Um, but like you said, for these other chains, yes, it's fat or yes, it's cheaper and faster, but it hasn't been stress tests, truly. So we'll find out, right? We're all going to find out in real time. Um, but um, I'm, I'm eager to see how this all shakes out. But yeah, I think um, we've got to be realistic at the end of the day that Ethereum, even if it is faster, that there's going to be desire from people to want to use other chains. But then we've got to be careful because you know, there was that there was a front end attack on, on Badger the other day. That wasn't even a blockchain attack. That was a front end attack. You, you hear about these exploits from bridging. Um, so you know, we've got to make sure that if we are going to start going cross chain, cross chain, that is bulletproof again. Um, you know, you start adding all this in, it just adds more risk. And we're not risk averse. We just we just want to be. We just want to make sure that we're we're protecting our users, protecting our community. Um, so it's got to be we've got to do it properly. So adding these bridges into these new these new chains is going to be something we're take very seriously when we do it. For sure, and I think that is great that y'all are looking at all that and covering all your bases. Um, so th thanks for sharing all that insight, man. But as we wrap up here, I always like to end with two fun questions. The first of which is with all of the knowledge that you've been able to gain over the years of being in this space, if you could go impart one or two pieces of wisdom to yourself when you first got in, what would you tell yourself? <laughs> um, take more risks. I think, um, like I said earlier about the uh, looking at Bitcoin at that price, or regardless of the price, just not getting involved because it just seemed like something that was a bit too uh, out there. I think you've got to take more risks and, and believe in yourself uh, a bit more. I think um, I definitely would have done more of that when I was younger. Um, I don't do more of it now. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's something I wish I'd have started doing at a younger age. Right. Okay. Well, that's definitely a good piece of advice on that. And man, what is a final thought that you want to leave with all the listeners here today? I think as a final thought, I would say that I would get involved with Yop right now because at the moment we have a very low price and it's not going to be there for much longer. We're about to go to the moon. We're about to go crazy. And, uh, and once that starts, yeah, you, I, I'm mad people are here saying that they got left behind or they've missed, they've missed this or missed that. Don't miss this opportunity. Yop's going to be huge. So that's a good final thought to listen when for all of those who just heard that and are like, yep, I need to jump on this. What are ways that people can uh, learn more about it? So there's the yacht.finance website. Um, at the moment, it's just a revised landing page, but we're about to launch the new website in January as well. Uh, you can also find us on Telegram and Discord. There are main platforms as well. And of course, Twitter. Um, yeah. And if you want to hear more from me, I'm uh, D Burrows on Twitter. Perfect. And we'll make sure to add those links down in the show notes. But again, Dave, thank you so much for spending some time with us and dropping all that knowledge. I know that I feel more informed after this conversation. And of course, for everyone listening, stay cryptocurrent.